Passive House Design Patterns Part 2 The Energy Balance In this video, we expand on the Passive House big idea of balanced investments in building performance by way of the use of an energy balance. The first video of the series included some bullet points about how an understanding of energy balances might guide the design process. Let's start with some definitions. Here's a cutaway of a residential building. Its details aren't particularly important, but let's use it as a context for our discussions around energy balances. One way to imagine an energy balance is as a network. A diagram with nodes where we measure temperatures, humidity, and other things, and then a path between nodes where heat or air or radiation might travel. A simple arrangement of nodes would have one that represents ambient conditions and one which represents the average state of the rooms in the building. We could, of course, increase the number of nodes and keep track of conditions in each of the rooms in the building and the state within the facade itself. Some energy balances include hundreds, if not thousands, of such nodes. The temperature and humidity at a node is the result of interactions with other parts of the building. Such interactions are represented by a way of the paths of the networked diagram. The paths included in the sketch are typical of the myriad of paths that engineering software is tasked with keeping track of. Let's delve into these paths. The first is ventilation. Air moving between rooms and through windows and grills in the facade. These paths are visible to us and ones that we might actually have some control over. Infiltration is air flowing through faults in the facade, which we have little or no control over. Air movement, if there's a temperature difference along the way, translates into the movement of heat. Sometimes we can use this to improve comfort, but it also might be sensed by occupants as a cold draft. Many schemes, such as Passive House, have a goal of the facade with few faults so as to limit the uncontrolled movement of air. Next, let's look at solar gains. The impact of direct solar radiation is literally visible to see in the sun patches which travel over surfaces and rooms. Diffuse radiation comes from other parts of the sky. On cloudy days, diffuse radiation tends to dominate. Where and how much radiation that arrives at a building gets inside depends on the form of the facade obstructions near the building, the properties of glass, whether or not we're using blinds. Glazing that faces away from the sun still gets diffuse solar radiation. In terms of the energy balance, although glass absorbs some radiation, it is when radiation actually hits surfaces that the fun begins. Some is absorbed on the surface and turns into heat. Some is reflected and bounces around to be absorbed by other surfaces. Eventually, there is a time lag, the warm surfaces give up some of their heat to the air in the room. Sometimes this giving up of heat to the air process offers us free heating. At other times, it offers us free discomfort. We can take design decisions to limit overheating. For example, careful design of shading devices choosing to use massive materials where the sun patches are an issue, placing rooms which have high heat gains, such as kitchens, away from strong solar gains. Poorly controlled patterns of solar radiation are of particular concern in high efficiency building. So next is our focus on internal gains. People are kind of like old incandescent 100 watt light bulbs, and we use stuff that generates heat. We also turn on lights, Side effect is the generation of heat. Again, sometimes this heat displaces heat that we would have had to buy. Sometimes it contributes to overheating. If we pretend we are assessing an empty building where none of these heat gains are happening, we will overestimate heating demands and underestimate cooling demands. If we pretend we're assessing a building that always is occupied and nothing gets turned off, then we get an estimate of performance which is wrong in the other direction. Next is heat transfer through the facade. Walls, floors, roofs, doors and windows 
are all conduits for heat flow. The magnitude depends on their composition, as well as the current driving forces at the faces of these entities. In the simplified network shown in the sketch, we see heat transfer through opaque and transparent portions of the facade, as well as the foundation. In a more complex network, the facade might be subdivided into scores or hundreds of individual surfaces, each with specific properties and boundary conditions. Whatever re resolution we choose, the heat transfer through these facade elements results in particular temperatures on the surfaces bounding the rooms of the building, and thus are connected to the energy balance of those rooms. The next aspect of energy balance is heat storage. The fabric of the building has a thermal inertia and thus acts as a thermal sponge. If we inject a lot of heat into a space, it does not instantly get hot. And if a heater turns off, the room does not instantly cool off. Thus, an energy balance needs to include heat storage in order to account for these observations. The next focus is where heat transfer through surfaces is not to the ground and not to the outside. Buildings include spaces which are not intentionally heated and cooled, or which may be controlled differently from the occupied rooms. These spaces form a boundary condition for quite a bit of the occupied space and thus can have a substantial impact on performance. And if there's a likely exchange of air, such as when we are passing through a vestibule, then we might also be interested in that contribution to the energy balance. So each of these heat transfer paths add or subtract heat within the energy balance. At any moment of time, these gains and losses add up to zero. And over any period of time, a week, a day, a year, these gains and losses also add up to zero. So the essential nature of the energy balance is that everything is thermophysically connected. Thus, design choices have the potential to alter the performance of other portions of the building. And an energy balance is a brilliant way of exploring how this is happening. So let's move from a sketch representation to what we might actually see in an engineering tool. Here's a zone energy balance from a detailed numerical simulation model for an assessment run during the month of March. Each line of this report tracks the gain and loss over that period for a specific heat flow path. We can see in the totals line that gains and losses are almost identical. So what does this energy balance say? Well, infiltration, that uncontrolled movement of air through the facade, is a big number. It's not quite the magnitude of heat loss through the opaque surfaces to the outside, but it's getting up there. So if we wanted to purchase less heat, then doing something about infiltration would have almost as much impact as reducing heat flows through the facade. So as a designer, you could then ask, would it cost less to deal with infiltration or buying more insulation? Let's look at one of the smaller numbers, heat transfer through transparent fa surfaces facing the outside. It's a small number. If we doubled the performance of the glass, it wouldn't really change the energy balance. These numbers give us clues as to where to invest our design efforts as well as our capital. Compliance tools also report aspects of the underlying energy balance. Sometimes these are in tables, sometimes they take a graphical form. The point is, if you change some aspect of the building or how it is used, then it's possible to track the consequences of that change, whether it's intentional or unintentional, by looking at the numbers or the graphs. So this is an energy balance is an asset in identifying the location as well as the nature of problematic aspects of the building. It can inform decisions about the least cost or least hassle changes that might improve performance. It really is like a detective novel follow the numbers.